Uh, we'll move over now to Dave Ruckley. As I mentioned before, he's a learning technologist at Swansea, uh, and he's going to be talking to us about the processes that he's gone through with setting up an online MSc. So Dave, if you're ready to share. Yep, uh, let me just uh, click a few buttons, make sure I've got the right screen. Right, I think everyone can see that. Um, yeah, hi, uh, I'm Dave. I'm a learning technologist, as, uh, as Nigel said. Um, I work in the medical school, um, delivering, helping deliver the distance courses, um, the distance MSCs, um, specifically diabetes practice and medical education. Um, before I was in this role, I worked at Cardiff University delivering CPD and uh, assessments to pharmacists across Wales. So I've got quite a lot of um, background in distance learning. Um, so if I just give you a bit of background on the um, the diabetes course, um, it was the first full distance MSc that we delivered in Swansea, um, in the medical school anyway. Um, it was split over two years. Uh, it's aimed at professionals um, who are in the workplace in the NHS. Um, and uh, it's mostly delivered online. We do have residential weeks. Uh, there's one week in the first year, one in the second year. Um, our students, uh, they're primarily nurses. Some of them are diabetes specialists. Some of them are just general nurses who want to get into the, uh, the more diabetes specialist side of things. But uh, this year we've got a dentist joining us and we actually have someone who's just got diabetes. He wanted to know more about diabetes. So uh, he's joined us. Um, I don't like lectures, video lectures, personally. Um, I know probably a lot of us in the last couple of months have probably got Zoom uh, fatigue from all the Zoom meetings and events and things that we've been attending. I get the same sort of issues with video lectures. So I wanted to diversify as uh, the way we delivered this content as, as much as possible, um, using different formats, uh, trying to replicate different aspects of um, the face-to-face -face learning experience. Um, and also using different types of assessment that sort of um, replicated things they would do in university, but also things they might do in the workplace um, because they, we want them to apply the skills and the, um, the learning that they've done. Uh, it's primarily based around things like active learning, um, applying as much as possible, but also using other methodologies, you know, gamification, safe failing uh, uh, during scenarios and things like that. Um, I'll go into a demo because it's much cooler to look at that than a PowerPoint. Uh, so if I open that up. So in the first year, our, our goal is really to just get people um, up to speed to the same level of knowledge and understanding of the topic of diabetes. Um, so assessments and things and teaching is quite basic. It's a couple of e-learnings, there's discussion boards, reflective practice, just getting them used to doing those things because we build on all those skills in the second year. Assessments are quite basic. There were MCQs and essays because those are sort of the best way we found to just check everyone's understanding and knowledge. Um, in the second year, we, we do ramp things up a bit because what we want to do is say, look, we've got the knowledge now. We want you to start applying that knowledge. We want you to start um, start really showing us you don't just know how to read an e-learning and write an essay about it. We want you to sh show that you can actually apply this thing, this stuff. Um, so if I show you what our weeks look like in the second year, we start off quite simple giving them learning objectives, reading lists, um, pre-reading for the course, and assignment information. It's quite basic in the first week. We just introduce them. In the second week, though, especially in, uh, on this uh, module, we really kick things off. So we give them e-learnings. Um, that opens up properly. Uh, these replace all our lectures because we don't do anything synchronous if we can help it we try to keep everything asynchronous our students are in the workplace they haven't got time to attend live lectures um, and with this this is all the background information that they would need to um, to know about this topic where this really applies though is oh
where this really falls into place is the next step, which is the first game that we developed, a retinopathy game. We thought about giving them MCQs and pictures and just asking them to grade it, but we wanted to make it a bit more engaging. So we built a game. Um, we give them points. We give them uh, we give them different difficulty levels. We give them random questions. Um, so we present them with an image like this. They can zoom in. They can have a proper look, and then they have they get an MCQ, or they might get a fill in the blanks. There's different question types here. They select those, and they work through. And the difficulty level, they get points to the correct answers. Um, something that Ian actually mentioned uh, about showing answers that we give them a button to show an answer at any time, but they will not get a point for this question. Um, so if they're really not sure, we can get they they have that prompt to um, to do that themselves. We've got things like clicking on images. I don't know where the hotspots are on here. Um, asking them to chip, to click certain things. Uh, the questions up there. Again, I don't know what each thing is. I'm pretty sure that one. Um, and they work through this. I'll skip through. I'm going to get a terrible score, but I think that will be fine. The idea of this is to sort of, it's quite boring to just get an image and get questions. What we wanted to do is add those game things, knowing they've got, they get points during this, knowing that they can check answers, um, knowing that things are random. Uh, if I get right to the end. There we go, I was doing some calculations, I think, in the background. And oh, no, there's a fill in the blanks. And at the end, this is where the gamification really kicks in. They get a percentage, and we prompt them to restart or return to the module. What we found with this is instead of a student doing a quiz once, as soon as you gave them a score, they wanted to better that score. We had students going back in four, five, six times to do better each time. What we got from that is we know they're better at grading images because they keep they kept doing it. So sort of replicating what they would do in the workplace, they would be given an image, they have to grade it, um, but using those games sort of uh, processes to um, to get them engaging with that. Where is that one? That one. Um, within the course as well, we have videos from patients. What we wanted to do is put a sort of human face on the topic, um, as well as reflective practice, because um, what we wanted to do there is give them the skills to be able to um, read a paper, read some research after they've finished the course and apply that and understand it and properly understand it. But also if they're having discussions with um, with specialists, with patients, to be able to take apart that information and challenge it and understand and be able to apply then that knowledge. Um, we also um, use case studies quite extensively. Uh, again, these are interactive. The idea is to give them some background information and um, and get them to fill in what they think the answer is. We also give them a suggested answer again, getting them to check that all of these were formative, um, just to get them used to the um, get them used to the format. And I think next week is the end of another game. What we also did uh, for this week, because it was quite a boring topic, not for the people who specialize in it, obviously, but we created a different game, which was um, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? That wasn't there. Um, and this one, again, uses gamification to sort of just get them more engaged with the content. So we gave them lifelines. Um, we gave them a scoreboard and... Uh, we got them to even lock in answers, uh, which they really liked. With the um, with the lifelines, uh, the idea was we wouldn't actually always give them the correct answer. With these, we wanted them to still make some decisions based on the question. Um, so they could go through, they would think probably it is a, 
but it's not necessarily the case. I think it is in this one. Um, and what we found again, just like with the um, with the retinopathy game, they kept going through this. They kept trying to do better. Kept trying to get to the end without using lifelines. Um, especially when they found out lifelines could be wrong. They were quite shocked by that. But that sort of replicates if you went to someone in the workplace, you asked them a question, and they weren't quite sure of the answer. We wanted to replicate that, so they still had to go do further reading. Um, so we've done that. Um, all this built up to uh, the next module, where they actually were given scenarios which were summative. Uh, what we did with those is using the same technology, um, gave them a bit of information, but what we took away was their ability to check answers and we made it a bit more complex. What we were hoping is, based on the previous things they'd done, they were kind of understood what they had to do um, and understood the process that they had to go through. With this, because it was summative, they again, they didn't get answers till they got their feedback. Um, but what we found is this was a really nice way of testing some of the skills and some of the knowledge that they had um, without having to just give them an essay or something like that. At the end of this, I won't fill it in. But what they did was downloaded a PDF, uh, which is open to demo here, which has all their answers in and they submitted that via turn it in um, on the VLE. This was their mark, they got feedback on all their answers. So it sort of built on what they uh, had previously done. Um, some of them, like this one here, uh, was all marked within the VLE itself. Um, so they were given a screen from a uh, Libra and they had to answer again based on the information they had, just like if a patient came in, showed them sort of the data they had on their uh, Libra, um, and they, then they had to give the advice to uh, the person. I don't know if I'm getting any of these right. Um, let's skip through. There we go. Uh, again, at the end, they get a screen similar to what they got in those earlier games, a score, which kind of gave them an idea of how they were doing. They did get feedback on this one as well. Um, that all, in those previous modules, that all still built up again to this final module, which the students are actually doing this as, as we speak, um, which is sort of a, a combination of all the scenarios, all the case studies, and all the um, games where we actually get them to run tests, we get them to do bloods, and we build in things like timers. Um, so just like in real life, they, would, they wouldn't they would get a test result straight away. They'd have to wait. We're not making them wait days because that would be unfair. Um, but we give them a bit of a time, so they have to stop. They have to think, again, replicating what they would do um, in the workplace um, and then base their notes on um, what those results are. They can prescribe, we give them different options. Some of these are red herrings um, and depending on what they prescribe, if they monitor anything, um, once they continue, it will react to what, the, um, what they've done and um, the patient will either go to ITU They'll be doing really well they won't be doing quite as well and the students have to then go through the scenario based on what they did early on um, so all this is to say we've we're sort of trying to replicate the things that we would normally do with oskis or in labs or in seminars or in you know in workshops trying to get all that and delivering it online um, in a really engaging way um, and sort of get them slowly used to doing this stuff so we don't throw we would never throw this um scenario at them straight away it's it's too much it's too overwhelming for our students what we wanted was to sort of get them used to doing this kind of thing um 
alongside essays and um, and more traditional MCQs. Uh, if I just go back to the course, uh, just to discuss actually some of the things that Ian mentioned in his um, conclusions, um, things to do with consistency. Um, you'll notice all the layouts for all the modules and all the weeks are the same or similar. It gives students, especially um, if they're mostly learning online, it gives them that sort of um, that comfort that everything's going to look the same every week. It's going to be similar. They're going to be comfortable. Um, they're not going to have to spend time searching for things or trying to work out everything each week. Um, this is probably going to be more and more what courses are going to start looking like now with COVID, um, with more things work, moving online. It's not just going to be a repository for content anymore. It's going to be a more, this is going to be your lear learning space. So um, it is important to have um, clear navigation, clear instructions, because they can't just ask you um, what to do. You know, we give them little blurbs on everything. Everything has information assigned to it. Um, and yeah, uh, what we've tried to do is not just replicate the experience of being in, in a face-to-face learn, -face learning um, space, but also um, utilize the, the, the technology that we have got access to, to, um, to really engage the students, active, have them actively using the content and engaging with the content. It's not just reading, it's not just watching a video, it's you, it's clicking things, it's uh, answering questions, it's watching uh, watching things and then answering, it's reflecting on things. Sort of bringing all those skills together um, into one course, really. Um, uh, and that's about it, really. It's, you know, just wanted to show you some of the interesting sort of case study things, the scenarios and what we've done there. Um, and yeah, I'd happy to pass back to Nigel to answer any questions anyone might have um, on that, really. Brilliant. Thanks, Dave. That's fantastic. Uh, yeah, we've had loads of questions coming into the chat. Oh, so quite along the same sort of strand. So um, a lot of people asking how easy the games are to create and what software you've used for the games. Um, I use Articulate Storyline, which is mostly an e-learning authoring tool um but with a bit of work and a bit of uh fiddling about with it you can make it have you can make it do some of the scoring some of the gamification stuff and um pushing out of the pdfs uh for the basic stuff like building the e-learning uh storyline is really easy it's just a jazzed up version of PowerPoint essentially. That's what it started off as a plugin for PowerPoint and then became its own product. Um, once you start getting into that gamification kind of thing, that's when you have to look at JavaScript and things. The good thing for me is I don't know any of that stuff really. I don't really understand it. I'm a technical guy, but I'm not that kind of technical. Um, but I use the community that's out there of people who have done similar things and I sort of bring in their skills to actually build these things so it's not all me it's all these smart people on the internet so where would where would people go to to find those resources i mean a lot of the people are asking how easy the games are to create so if there's scripts and stuff out there already how willing are people to share them and um the, yeah the articulate articulate is a paid piece of software um it's not free there are free things like Xerti out there um, but the community, a lot of it is just an open forum on the Articulate website where they sh people share scripts, they share demos of um, the different things they've built, um, and they just put them up there for free for anyone to use and modify, which, which is, uh, is really great, actually. Uh, in terms of the feedback, we've had a few questions as well. So did you need to give feedback to students on their reflective sections? And also, were the answers checked to make sure, or sorry, or did the students just make a judgment on suggested answers to see if they were close to being right? So what kind of quality control is there there? 
for the formative stuff, we just leave it up to the students um, to uh, to read um, the the suggested feedback and sort of um, fold that into the learning they've already done. For the summative stuff, yeah, we do go in, we look at their answers, we tell them where they went right or wrong um, and why. So we give them much more detail there. What we want is in the earlier weeks is for them to just get used to engaging with these tools, giving their answers, reading feedback and stuff. And hopefully by the end, and what we do see is by the end, they have actually uh, used all that stuff. Um, same with the reflective practice. Um, that all feeds into things like live a couple of live debates that we do where we get them to bring in the evidence that they might have read bring in their opinions on that um and the the academic staff will actually engage with those um in the discussion board um and sort of say well I, about this did you read that paper properly because it actually in the conclusion so we do give them some feedback on that um but but the reflective stuff does tend to feed into other assessments as well. So that's where we check that. A lot of it is they can practice safely. We don't want to, them thinking we're looking over their shoulders all the time. But then in the summative parts of the of the assessments, that's when we we sort of fold in those um, fold in those skills that they've hopefully picked up and feedback there. Um, well. We it's the same information and skills introduced using multiple methods, e.g. in a game and in a reflective exercise? Um, no, we try and keep it um, separate, as separate as we can. The games are, and the games and the, um, and the scenarios and things like that are more to actually apply skills and stuff, whereas the reflective um, the reflective elements, the sort of more written traditional elements are um, are kept separate. So those are for sort of checking knowledge and understanding rather than actual skills. Okay. Uh, course looks really nice. Many of us will be doing similar quickly next semester. In your opinion, what do you consider a stripped back version of this to look like? What are the key things to include? Um, I can show you we've been working on a CPD module for Swansea um, uh, which is a bit more uh, basic in the way it looks if I share my screen again uh, that one. Uh, this is what I would say an introduction some basic navigation and if I go into say lectures um, you know, a video introduction, putting a face on things, not just being words on the screen. Um, there's an activity and then there's a button to further resources. A course doesn't have to be all singing or dancing. It can be quite nice and basic. I think the key things are nice, clean navigation, um, preferably in one place. So just on that home page. Um, and keeping all your content similar. So have instructions, um, don't just have walls of text, you know, just just like you would for any website you go on, if it was busy, if it was really hard to navigate, you wouldn't use it. You know, the best online tools and things that you've used, the websites, they keep it simple, they keep it nice. And, um, and yeah, you, you just want it to be as quick as possible for the students to get in, find what they want, work through it and get out and carry on with what else they're doing. Uh, if you've got time, you can add all the extra all singing or dancing jazzy things that I like to do. But with in the situation we're in, I think it's just key to get everything up and as clear as possible um, in a logical order. This module here we've put together in three weeks, I think it is. It's not um, whereas the diabetes one was months. Um, so with this, you know, this is what you can do in a couple of weeks, keeping it simple and just getting that information out to the students as, as uh, best you can and as neatly and tidy as you can. I'm so glad you didn't click on the STEM one for that. Thank you. Oh, I can do that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, 
do you give an indication to students of how long a task is likely to take or is it just left to themselves um with the e-learnings we give them a sort of this an introduction section to each of the e-learnings that tells them roughly how long that'll take we do give them the caveat that if they click all the reference links and things it'll take longer um but for other tasks we're, we're not really sure a lot of the time it depends how quickly they're reading um it, it it depends we try and give them um the freedom to spend as much or as little time as they want on these things um you know they're professionals with busy lives we don't want to say you have to spend um two hours reading this paper and reflecting on it if they want to just quickly skim it and write a reflection and then go back to it later they can um with videos we try to give them an indication of roughly how long those are so they know um how much time they need to just sit there watching those but we try and keep videos short less definitely less than half an hour probably closer to 10 15 minutes so they're nice and bite size um and it's not just an overwhelming um task we try and keep everything bite size everything less than an hour as much as we can especially in that course okay great uh, what do you think of short videos versus written material to see uh, to first see the context or is there another way to first show the content i think it depends on the content some things are much more easily understood with visuals so a video with a um with voice over powerpoint or something like that where you've got if you've got lots of diagrams if this if it's not something that's really easily understood in a in text um it depends on the content i, I always come down to tell me what the content is and then i'll help you find the best way to deliver it um so you know something might be best explained as a as a bit of text with bullet points and lists and all things like that some things it's just easier to have someone talk for 10 minutes in a video i think you just need to as long as you know what your content is you know try and find that how would you like to learn it how do you think it would be best represented and how is it best digested by a student i know most students would probably cry if they saw just walls and walls of text that they have to read um when the other option was a 15 minute video from a lecturer um so yeah it, it just depends on the content really okay uh and last question we've got here is how long was the development and testing phase for the diabetes module and how much input was needed from people like clinical specialists people like yourself um the first module of diabetes i started in swansea in may and it launched at the end of september of 2018 um so the turnaround on that was really really quick um that was to develop 20 e-learnings and case studies and record all the videos and everything like that so we we condensed it quite quickly um into this is what we need and we need to push it out quickly uh to students um in terms of input i, I don't know anything about diabetes i don't know anything about medical stuff in general um despite where I've worked for the last 10 years. Um, I just take the content from academics, from uh, specialists. All the e-learning is written by specialists in their field. All I do is take their PowerPoints or the presentations and things they normally would do, present them in a different way. So we, some of them we said, look, just record this as a video, write this bit as a case study, and we'll do this little bit as an e-learning. So from that point of view content always comes from the smart people i would say the academics the specialists um and i just help deliver it in the best way possible really um so it, it's a it's it's a collaborative relationship it's not i do all this bit they do all that bit um if something just doesn't work in the way they've written it or it doesn't quite make sense to even me i will go back and i'll say look have you thought about redoing this can you rewrite this can you um, think of a different way to do this um so it just depends uh really but again it's a collaboration if you've got a learning technologist it's really good to get to know them because they can sort of help you rethink some of the content you've already got 
all our e-learning was um, pr was presentations they normally would give in a lecture theatre, um, especially in the first module, and we just repurposed that in a slightly more interesting and engaging way um, for the distance audience, really. <laughs>